In the world today, there are many differing viewpoints about baptism. Some say that babies should be baptized, while others say that it is only reserved for adults. Many disagree on the very method of baptism. Some believe that baptism is necessary for salvation, while others do not. What is the truth about baptism? And have you ever wondered about whether or not you needed to be baptized? And if you have been baptized, was your baptism for the right reason as described in the Bible? Let's listen now to John Moore as he leads us in our study of searching for truth about baptism. Water. It's one of our most precious resources. Without it, this world as we know it would not exist. We absolutely have to have it in order to sustain life. In fact, it quenches our thirst. It can cleanse us. It can make us feel like a new person after a hard day's work. Is it any wonder then that in the Bible, water is used by God as an important element and symbol for purification and cleansing? Whether it was the flood of Noah which cleansed the earth, the ritual purification for cleansing in Judaism, or in the New Testament, where we read of thousands upon thousands being baptized, water was a very important part of God's plan in saving souls. But how and why was it a part of God's plan? Why were believers baptized into water? And is it necessary that a person be baptized today for salvation? And if so, what does a person need to know before they can be baptized? Now before we begin our search, I want to ask you to do something. I'd like to ask you to answer some very important questions. If you need to, stop the program for just a moment and find something to write with and something to write on. And when you return, I'd like for you to write out a response to the following questions. Number one, are you now in a saved relationship with God? Or has there ever been a point in your life in which you knew you were saved? In other words, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Now, if you don't know the answer to that question, then just simply write, I'm not sure. Number two, if at this moment or at some point in the past you were saved, how did you become saved? In other words, what did you do or say to become saved or to become a Christian? Number three, have you ever been baptized? And if you have, was it done by sprinkling, pouring, or immersion? Number four, were you baptized as a small child or as an adult? Number five, were you saved before your baptism or after baptism? And number six, what was the purpose of your baptism? Now having answered those questions, let's begin our search for truth about baptism. And as we study through the Bible, let me encourage you to think very seriously about your relationship with God. Because if you are not yet saved, in this session, we're going to be learning what you need to do to become saved. However, if you feel you are saved already, let me encourage you as well to compare the answers you gave a moment ago to our questions to the information that we will present in this session so that you can see if what you were taught about how to become saved is consistent and in keeping with the Word of God. Now remember, as we have observed over and over again, truth is what will make us free. The commandments of men and the traditions of men will not make us free. Neither will good intentions nor a sincere attitude in and of themselves will make us free. Only Jesus and the power of His Word can set us free. And so let's begin our search for truth. And as we do, let's see what we can discover about baptism. And as we search, let's answer these four very important questions. Number one, what is baptism? Number two, what is the purpose of baptism? Number three, 
who should be baptized? And number four, have you been scripturally baptized? So let's begin with the first question. What is baptism? Baptism is an immersion. It is uh, a word that was very commonly used in the New Testament days and not strictly in a religious sense. It was used, to my understanding, when a ship sank. It was uh, spoken of in this very same type of language that is used with regard to what we call baptism. The scriptures do speak with regard to more than one type of baptism, such as the baptism of John. There's, of course, also baptism by fire, baptism by the Holy Spirit. But we primarily need to center our thoughts on the baptism that we find that pertains to all of us. And when you begin to look at the scriptures, it uh, will tell us something of the nature of that baptism. One, it's obviously always done in water. Reference made to individuals coming up out of the water. Clearly they had been in the water. Consider, for example, what happened in the first century when an evangelist by the name of Philip taught a man of Ethiopia how to become a Christian. That story is recorded in Acts chapter 8. And there we learn that the Ethiopian was on his way from Jerusalem going toward Gaza and was sitting in his chariot and reading from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. It was at this point in the story that Philip entered and heard him reading from the 53rd chapter about a servant of God who would suffer on behalf of sinners. While hearing about the sacrificial nature of this suffering, the Ethiopian asked Philip the following. I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Notice now how Philip responded. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. From this passage, we can clearly see that Philip taught the Ethiopian about Jesus. Teaching someone about Jesus includes information about the deity of Jesus and about his love and about his power and most certainly about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. But now let's consider the immediate response to the preaching about Jesus. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. In this great story, we learn that not only was baptism a part of preaching about Jesus, but we also learn something about the mode or manner of baptism. In this instance, notice how that both Philip and the Ethiopian went down into the water. It was then, when they were in the water, that Philip baptized the Ethiopian. Thus, when one is immersed, they are plunged beneath the water. They are completely covered. In fact, they are being buried. And this is exactly how the Apostle Paul describes baptism. Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. In reference to this passage, Adam Clark, a well-known Bible scholar and preacher from the Methodist Church, concluded as well that the baptism of the New Testament was done by immersion. Alluding to the immersions practiced in the case of adults, wherein the person appeared to be buried under the water as Christ was buried in the heart of the earth, his rising again the third day and their emerging from the water was an emblem of the resurrection of the body. Notice also how a preacher from the Reformation period a man by the name of John Calvin of the Presbyterian Church described baptism. The very word baptize, however, signifies immerse. And it's certain that immersion was the practice of the ancient church. Today, however, there are many churches who have adopted the practice of sprinkling or pouring as a form of baptism. And yet nowhere in the New Testament is the practice of sprinkling or pouring connected to baptism. Sprinkling and pouring of water as a part of baptism is not a part of authentic Christianity. 
In the Greek language, which was the language in which all of the New Testament documents were originally written, there were words for both sprinkling and pouring. The word for sprinkling was hrino and would be used to describe the sprinkling of blood in, an, in a sacrifice, for example. The word for pouring was keo. And the interesting thing is that although both of these words were available to New Testament writers, they are never used in the New Testament in association with baptism. The only word that is used in association with baptism is baptisma, which has the root meaning of to submerge or plunge or immerse. Now, however, you might be asking, as some have, whether or not there was a sufficient amount of water in the land of Palestine during the first century to be able to baptize the large numbers of people that the Bible says were being baptized, for example, in Acts chapter 2 and also in John chapter 3. Well, let me tell you, first of all, that baptism by immersion doesn't always require a large amount of water. Baptism by immersion has been done in some very small places, such as bathtubs or watering troughs. But secondly, I would add that in the first century, sufficient water was available, both in the rivers and streams of Palestine, as well as in the many water collection systems built by the people of that ancient world. And thirdly, because of the Jewish emphasis upon ritual cleansing, many hundreds of baptistries, known as mikvahs, were already in place in and around major cities and places of worship. In Jerusalem alone, archaeologists have discovered approximately 150 of them dating to the time of Christ. So in answering our first major question about what is baptism, we must conclude that the baptism required of sinners under the New Testament was a baptism by immersion, that is, being plunged beneath the water. It was not a baptism done by sprinkling or pouring. But now, let's answer the question why. Why were sinners being baptized? In other words, for our second major question, what was the purpose of baptism? Was there something magical or mystical about the water that regenerated sinners in the first century? Or even today? Again, let's go back to the Bible and let the Bible be our guide in ascertaining truth in regard to that subject. And as we do, let's notice that under all three systems of religion are periods of time that are mentioned in the Bible. Let's notice how God used both blood and water as a means of spiritual cleansing and purification. Those periods of time and systems of religion are known as the Patriarchal Age, the Mosaical Age, and the Christian Age. In the Patriarchal period, water was used to cleanse the earth and save Noah and his family from destruction. Those floodwaters were spoken of by Peter as a figure for baptism in the Christian Age. Who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype, which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Under the patriarchal age, God also used the symbol of blood, the blood that came from animals, as a means for justification and for covenant. He did this as in the case of Abel and Noah and Abraham. Under the Mosaic Age, God likewise used the symbol of blood as a means for purification and redemption. As in the story of the Exodus, when God saved the nation of Israel from the death of their firstborn sons by passing over the doors of those who had placed blood on their doorpost. Especially in the book of Leviticus is the use of blood emphasized as blood was sprinkled on the altar, on the priest, and occasionally on the people. In addition to blood, water was likewise used under the Mosaic Age as a symbol for justification and purification. It was used for the purpose of purifying the priest who came to serve in the temple or tabernacle. It was also used to purify and cleanse the leper who was seeking readmittance into the camp of Israel. The use of these two elements under these two systems served as an important basis and foundation for their usage in the New Testament era. 
under the Christian age, Jesus shed his blood for the purpose of purification and cleansing. He was scourged, he was ridiculed, and then he was hung on the cruel cross of Calvary. It was on that cross that Jesus shed his blood. His blood was pure and innocent. And that blood was offered as a payment to purchase us, to purchase our freedom from the slavery of sin. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Not only does the blood of Jesus redeem, but it can also justify. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood. The word justification is a most interesting word, and it, as we look at it, it shows truly how much God loves all men everywhere. The word justified in the original text carries with the concept of being not guilty or to be acquitted. So there's a point in time in which God can say, that is when you reach the blood of Christ, that man no longer is guilty of that sin that he has been justified. Most assuredly then, the blood of Jesus saves. And yet, just as God under the Old Testament used both blood and water to purify and to cleanse, he likewise, under the new covenant today, uses both blood and water in the process of justifying the sinner. To better understand this relationship between blood and water, Let's turn our attention to the book of Romans where the Holy Spirit revealed how the blood of Jesus and the waters of baptism work together to bring about salvation. In the book of Romans, we find that the Apostle Paul in chapter 1 reminds his readers that the gospel, the word of God, is the power unto salvation. In chapters 2 and 3, he lets his readers know that Indeed, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The word all in this passage refers to all races and classes and nationalities of people. In this same chapter and in chapter 5, we learn that all of these people can be saved. They can be justified by the blood of Christ. They can be saved from the wrath of God by means of Christ's death. But it's in chapter 6 that we learn how those sinners are saved and at the point they are saved. And then Paul goes on to say as well how a Christian should live once he or she is saved. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Here we see on the one hand that those who were servants of sin had on the other hand become servants of righteousness. Now, what was it that made the difference? What was it that made them free from sin? How is it that they were able to have access to the benefits of the cleansing blood of Christ? In other words, what did they do to become Christians? First of all, in answering that question, let's notice that they were obedient. They did not just merely believe on the name of Jesus to be freed from their past sins. For faith alone cannot save. True saving faith involves works. It involves doing the will of God. You believe that there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Now the necessity of obedience was also confirmed by Jesus. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So you see, merely crying out to the Lord, or even boasting of what we have done in His name, 
is not sufficient. Jesus said we must do the will of the Father. Now while the works of men cannot save, the works of God can. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Friend, when we do what the truth says, that's how we come to the light. When truth is obeyed, it reveals that God is saving the sinner. Now, none of us by ourselves or in and of ourselves can save ourselves. And yet, when a sinner responds to truth, when they obey truth, God saves that person. That's exactly what happened in Romans chapter 6. When those sinners became free from sin, they did so when they were obedient. Now that we've learned that they were obedient, let's ask, what was it that they were obedient to? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. So what then did they obey? They obeyed the form of doctrine. But what was the doctrine? What was it that they had been taught? Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. As in Romans chapter 6, and now here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul makes reference to something which he had delivered and entrusted to Christians. What was it? It was his preaching about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Those three facts are fundamental to understanding the gospel of Jesus. They are fundamental in securing our salvation. Concerning his death, the Bible speaks about his horrible scourging and the terrible crucifixion he endured. But it also speaks about the blood that he shed on Calvary's cross. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. The law says we die, but Jesus said, I will take the place of sinful man. He for a time was separated from God. He satisfied the justice of God for man so that all people who by faith reach the blood of Jesus uh, can be justified, declared not guilty, declared free from sin. Not only did the gospel message include news about the death and the blood of Jesus, but it also included a detailed account about his burial. It told of how Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took the body of Jesus down from the cross and prepared it for burial. It told of how they placed the Lord's body in a tomb and how that within the confines of that burial chamber, our Lord's body lay until Sunday morning when by the power of God, he was resurrected. His resurrection meant that he had conquered death and that he indeed was the Messiah. Yes, the gospel message reveals how Christ victoriously conquered Satan, sin, and the grave. And by means of this victory, Jesus bridged the gap between God and the sinner. According to Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, sin is what separates a person from God. But by means of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, sinners now have the hope of walking across that bridge and being reunited with God. But however, when sinners are obedient to that form of doctrine that was revealed to them, that is the death, the burial, and the resurrection, does that mean that they have to literally die and literally be buried and literally be resurrected in order to be obedient? 
Let's listen again to Romans 6.17 to find out just exactly what it is that they must be obedient to. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Friend, what they had obeyed was not the doctrine or the teaching about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. But what they had obeyed was a form of that teaching. In other words, a pattern or something like that teaching. What was it? And did it include water baptism? Well, let's listen again to the Apostle Paul. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. It is here in this passage that we learn how justification and forgiveness are acquired. It is here that we learn how the death of Christ and His blood are intertwined with the waters of baptism. It is here that we learn how sinners at Rome became Christians. For just as Jesus had died on the cross, these Christians chose to die to the old man of sin by confessing Jesus as Lord. And just as Jesus was buried in a grave or tomb, so these sinners were buried in a watery grave of baptism. And just as Jesus was by the power of God resurrected to a new life, these sinners were by the same power brought forth out of baptism to walk in newness of life. Previous to baptism, they were spiritually dead. But after baptism, they were alive in Christ. They were in a resurrected state. Baptism, therefore, is for those who are dead in sin. To be spiritually resurrected and made alive in Christ, a person must be united with Jesus in baptism. The blood of Jesus and the waters of baptism are brought together in a very beautiful, life-saving way. It should not therefore be a surprise then to hear what Jesus said to a believing Jew by the name of Nicodemus. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Being born again and thereby becoming a child of God requires that a person be born of the water. That is to say, they must be baptized. As we have learned already in Romans 6, verses 17 and 18, to be free from sin and become a servant of righteousness, a sinner must be obedient in baptism to that form of doctrine as expressed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. In Romans 1.16 we learn that the gospel is God's power unto salvation. In Romans 6.17 we learn that that gospel can be and must be obeyed. Since that is true, we must therefore come to understand the gravity of the following passage of Scripture. And to give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So friend, the gospel must be obeyed. Now, a sinner cannot save himself or herself by literally being crucified or by literally being buried or by literally being resurrected. But a sinner can obey something similar to this. A sinner can be baptized into Christ and then arise to walk in newness of life. Now, at this point, you might be asking, can water in and of itself save? Is there something magical or mystical about water that can save a soul from death? No, friend. When we read the Bible in its entirety, nowhere does it suggest that water alone can save. But neither does the Bible teach us that faith alone can save. 
It is God's grace that saves, but also it is the Word of God, the truth, that tells us when a person is saved and at what point they are in a right relationship with Him. The only way to know whether baptism is essential for salvation is to check the biblical record. And 1 Peter 3 and verse 21 comes right out and says, baptism does also do something. What does it do? The Bible says baptism does also now save us. Now it's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not taking a bath to remove bodily dirt. But it does give us a good conscience and it's for remission of sins according to Acts 2.38 and it washes away sins according to Acts 22.16 the blood of Christ is what washes our sins away Revelation 1.5 but when does the blood of Christ wash our sins away it's when as a penitent confessing believer we're baptized this principle of being cleansed by God with water when we do exactly as he directs can also be seen in the Old Testament story of a Syrian general by the name of Naaman who was seeking to be cleansed of his leprosy. Naaman, in an attempt to rid himself of this horrible disease, came to the prophet Elisha hoping to receive some great pronouncement. Instead, Elisha told Naaman to dip himself seven times in the River Jordan. At first, Naaman resisted the idea that the River Jordan could somehow cleanse him and indeed, the waters of the Jordan River by itself alone could neither then nor now cleanse leprosy. But when that water was coupled with obedience to the command of God, the Syrian general was immediately made whole. His leprosy then, and only then, was cleansed. Likewise today, no amount of water by itself can cleanse us from the leprosy of sin. But when baptism is coupled with a true genuine faith, then God says we can be saved by the blood of Christ. It really is a matter of trusting in God to do what God said to do, when God said to do it, how God said to do it, and for the reason God said to do it. So, in answering our main question about the purpose of baptism, we have learned that baptism is for the remission of sins and also the means by which we become a servant of righteousness, a child of God, and a Christian. Uh, lastly, in order for one to be saved and to be able to uh, reap eternal life in heaven, one must be a member of, of Christ's body. Uh, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 that all spiritual blessings are in Christ. One of those spiritual blessings is that of salvation, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10. And so in order for one to have salvation, which is in Christ, one must get into Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13, For by one spirit are ye all baptized into one body. So also we can see that baptism places a person into the body of Christ, which is the church of Christ. It is also the means by which a person is clothed with Christ. It is the point in the process of conversion in which a person can call him or herself a Christian. Baptism then serves a very unique purpose to which a person must be fully aware. So this then leads us to our third major question, who should be baptized? In other words, what does a person need to know or do before baptism? And what about babies? Should babies be baptized? In answering these questions, let's begin by listening to the words of Jesus. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. From both of these passages, we can learn that something very important must occur before one can be scripturally baptized. What is it? Well, quite simply, it is preaching and believing. In order for a person to come to God, a soul must be taught they must hear the word of God. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. In addition to being taught, the one who wishes to be baptized must believe what is taught. Notice when Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We must ask, well, what is it that must be believed? 
Well, let's hear the entirety of that statement in its context. Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believes, that is, he that believes the gospel and is baptized shall be saved. The one who wants to be baptized must believe the gospel. A part of believing the gospel demands that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, the very Son of God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Belief in Jesus comes when we hear the Almighty Word of God. So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. But now let's also notice that believing the Gospel demands that we also believe in what Jesus taught in His New Covenant. In the New Covenant, Jesus taught that before a person can come to God in baptism, he or she must repent. Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now remember, as we studied in earlier lessons, Repentance isn't merely feeling sorry about our sins, but the Bible teaches that godly sorrow leads to repentance. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. What is repentance? Repentance then means to change. To change from living a life of sin to living a life of righteousness. Repentance also demands that we stop living according to our own will and start living according to the will of God by following in the footsteps of Jesus. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So who then can be baptized? The person who believes the gospel and repents of their sins. But still further, we learn that those who can be baptized are those who have confessed. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Now, let's put all of this together. Baptism must be preceded by teaching, and then belief, repentance, and confession. So who should be baptized? The sinner who is outside of Christ, the one who is taught, the one who believes, the one who repents, and the one who confesses. Well, what then should we do about baptizing babies or small children? Is it right or necessary to baptize them? It is not necessary to baptize the baby, nor is it scriptural. Baptism is for those who can hear the Word of God, who can believe it, who can understand it, and based upon that understanding, act upon it. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Not only that, but babies are not lost. They're safe. As Jesus said, Matthew 18:3 that we're to become as little children because little children have the characteristics of those who are in the kingdom of God. So babies are not lost. They don't need to be baptized. They wouldn't know about it anyway, wouldn't understand what was being done anyway. Baptism is for those who are accountable, who are mature, who have the ability to understand and thus to act by their own choice. The only reason a baby would need to be baptized is if the baby had sins that needed to be remitted. But according to Ezekiel 18.20, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. And Deuteronomy 24.16 lays down the principle, every man shall be put to death for his own sin. A baby hasn't transgressed the law of God, 1 John 3.4. And so a baby doesn't need to be baptized because he hasn't sinned, and he's not qualified to be baptized because he hasn't believed. Again, Sin is something committed, not inherited. But now let's address our last major question. And as we do, let's make it very personal. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about you, God, and baptism. 
And as we do, let's ask the question, have you been scripturally baptized? In other words, have you been baptized according to what the scriptures teach, according to the Bible, the Word of God? Deciding whether or not to be baptized is a very important decision. In fact, it's the most important decision that you can make. If you haven't been baptized, then according to the Bible, you are still yet in your sins because the saving blood of Christ and the benefits that we receive from that blood can only be realized in the God-ordained act of baptism. If you've never been baptized, then according to the Bible, you are not saved and you are not in the kingdom of God. Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. At the beginning of this lesson, I asked you a series of very important questions. The first of which was, are you saved? And so friend, I ask you again, are you saved? Are you in a right relationship with God? Have you done things in your life you knew that were wrong? Are you burdened with the guilt and the weight of sin? Are you in fact a sinner separated from God? Or are you uncertain about your relationship with God? Wouldn't you like to be absolutely certain? Wouldn't you like to be sure and know that you are saved? If you are separated from God because of your sin, please know that the blood of Jesus can justify sinners. It can cleanse your conscience. It can make you whole again. In fact, it can bring sweet redemption to your heart that has been held captive by Satan. However, in order to have forgiveness from God, you must be obedient to His will by being baptized. In fact, I encourage you this very hour to go and find the individual or the church that gave you this program and ask one of their members to baptize you into Christ for the remission of your sins. When you are baptized, you can then know the peace that passes all understanding. You can then know that you are a part of the family of God, the church. When you obey truth by being baptized for the remission of your sins, your soul can be purified. And, according to Colossians 1, verses 22 through 23, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled and not moved away from the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then, when you leave this life, you can anticipate the mercy of God and expect Jesus to present you before the heavenly throne as one who is blameless and beyond reproach. Once again, this should be the most important decision of your life. But equally important is the decision about if you believe you're saved already, whether or not what you did to become saved is consistent with the Word of God. Did you obey the commandments of men or did you obey the commandments of God? Did the answers you gave at the beginning of this session match those as revealed in the Word of God as presented in this program? For example, were you taught that to become a Christian you simply needed to believe on Jesus, asking Him to come into your heart? Or were you taught that to be saved you needed to recite a pre-written prayer? Or were you taught that to be saved you needed to believe on Jesus by confessing His name, repenting of your sins, and being buried with Him in baptism? If you were baptized, were you baptized by sprinkling, pouring, or immersion? Were you baptized as a small child or as an adult? True baptism, prescribed by God, is to be done by immersion, and it requires both faith and repentance. And, as we have seen, baptism was for the purpose of uniting a sinner into the death of Christ for the purpose of washing away sin. Was this the reason you were baptized? Were you baptized to be saved? Or were you baptized believing that you had been saved already? According to the Bible, baptism was for the remission of sins. And so if you were taught 
that you were saved before baptism, could you have been baptized for the remission of sins? Now, if your answers haven't matched the truths as we have just presented in the Bible, let me encourage you to correct your situation immediately. Being baptized for the right reason and in the right way and according to the truth of the gospel is absolutely critical. This is exactly what happened in the city of Ephesus when the Apostle Paul found some disciples who had not been baptized for the right reason. This story is recorded in the 19th chapter of Acts and reveals that there were some individuals there who were practicing a form of Christianity and had even been baptized. However, after further inquiry by Paul, he soon discovered that their baptism had not been done according to the will of God. It was at that point that Paul corrected their false ideas related to their baptism, to which they responded by being baptized again. This time, however, their baptism was done in the name of Christ Jesus. Their first baptism was no doubt done with the best of intentions, but it was not done according to the truth of the gospel. I wonder how many people today have been baptized with the best intentions, and yet their baptism wasn't according to truth. If, for example, you were not baptized by immersion or for the remission of sins, can you honestly say that your baptism was according to truth, according to the divine pattern revealed in the Word of God? Remember, you will be judged by the Word of God. And so can you say without any doubt that your baptism was done just exactly as the Bible prescribes? according to the divine pattern as revealed in the death and in the burial of the resurrection of Christ. Once more, that pattern requires that a sinner follow the steps of salvation, which involves, number one, hearing the gospel, number two, believing the gospel, number three, repenting of sins, number four, confessing the name of Jesus, number five, being immersed for the remission of sins, and then, of course, number six, to live faithfully unto God. If you are not absolutely certain about whether or not you have followed these steps completely, then please don't take a chance on missing heaven. Please obey the truth today, because remember, the truth and only the truth can make you free. So have you obeyed the truth, or have you obeyed the commandments and traditions of men if you obey the commandments and traditions of men, then obviously you have not obeyed the truth. Remember what the Apostle Peter wrote when he said to those Christians, when they obeyed the truth, he said their souls were purified. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Purified souls come from obeying the purified truth. And the truth is that comes from Jesus, as recorded in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, is that not everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, but instead those who do the will of the Father will be saved. Friend, have you done the will of the Father? Have you been baptized for the remission of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? into the church of Jesus Christ? Please, don't delay another minute. Go in search of the Church of Christ. And once you find that church, ask one of its members to baptize you for the remission of your sins. After your baptism, call yourself a Christian and nothing more. Begin worshiping according to the truth of the Gospel. Seek first the Kingdom of God and His righteousness and never forsake the opportunity to assemble with a church. And finally, always remember the words of Jesus. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Friend, now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day to believe and obey the truth. Now that you know the truth, will you obey it? Friend, tomorrow, 
tomorrow may be too late. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Friend, do you love Jesus? If you love Jesus, I know you will respond to the truth about our Creator, to the truth about our authority and religion, to the truth about the church, to the truth about the house of God, and to the truth about baptism. Friend, now that you know the truth, how will you respond? Will you trust in the Lord? Will you believe and obey the truth? Your eternal destiny will be determined by what you do with the truth. It's now in your hands. I pray and hope that you'll live according to the truth. Seek the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Listen to the words of wisdom that he speaks. If you have questions, he has answers. His truth and glory shall never falter. Seek the truth. And the truth shall set you free. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, He is the way. Christ is the answer. God's love sent for you. Survey His gospel. Jesus will save you. Seek the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Continue in His Word, a disciple evermore. You seek to please Him, He looks to aid you. Heaven is waiting, God will fail you. Seek the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Listen to the words of wisdom that he speaks. If you have questions, he has answers. His truth and glory shall never falter. Seek the truth, and the truth shall set you free.